Hello. Last week we looked at the fall, and now this week in Genesis 3, 14 through 24, we're going to look at the results of the fall. Uh, you know, it was kind of like the serpent was saying, God really won't uh, do this. God really won't judge you. He's just trying to make it tough on you. Well, everything that God says is going to come true right here. And the lying nature of the evil one is going to be seen. Jesus in John said he's been a liar from the beginning. And many folks believe this is where that is shown to be true. So let's begin in Genesis 3.14. And the Lord God said to the serpent. Now the other two he asked questions of, but he doesn't ask questions of the serpent. Many have said, well, why would God judge an animal? Well, the animal was a tool of the evil one. Uh, you say, yeah, but he's just caught up in it. Satan and his tools always reap the consequences of their acts. So the serpent is going to be judged here. Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. Earlier we saw this, that the serpent was one of the beasts of the field created by God. Now this seems to imply in English that all the animals were cursed some way, but the serpent more than the rest. But that's not what it means here. The Hebrew can be translated, cursed are you out of all the cattle. And that seems to be the idea here. The rabbis say that God just cut the serpent's legs off and made him crawl in the dust. I'm not, I don't know if that's what's going to happen or not, but uh, there seems to be a change here. Um, and on your belly you will go. Now some say because the rainbow probably existed before the flood, like in Genesis 9.13, but took on new significance, maybe the snake was always crawling on his belly, but that took on new significance. I hear that, and I understand where they're coming from, but I really think the rainbow wasn't before the flood. And I really don't, I think the serpent probably did walk upright. In a uh, snake skeleton, you can still see the remnants of the back feet. And so uh, if that happened here or not, that seems to imply this. Notice it mentions here, in the dust you shall eat. Now in Isaiah 65, 25, this same allusion is drawn. I don't think this is like the Arabs who think that snakes eat dust. There's a lot of wild stuff here. Uh, the, rabbi, the rabbis say that the way God cursed the serpent was the gestation period. Because you see, they think this was a sexual experience between Eve and the serpent. Uh, and so they said the gestation period of cattle was the longest, but now the serpent's going to be the longest, which means the serpent will carry her young longer. And the rabbis said it took seven years for serpents to have children. We know that's biologically inaccurate and is one of the examples of, of uh, way too much interpretation that's been done on uh, uh, just a few beginning scripture text. Now this dust you shall go. It seems to be this first part of verse uh, 14 is dealing with the literal serpent. But when we come to verse 15, we're going to be dealing with Satan. So it seems the curse involves not only the snake, but the one who empowered the snake, which is the, the evil one. And we see that from Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, and Revelation 20, verse 2. This in the dust you shall go, it seemed that uh, anything, you know, that crawled in the dust um, was unclean to Hebrews. We see that from Leviticus chapter 11, um, and you may want to look that up. I believe it's verse 42. I've lost my note right here on that, but you might want to look that up. Now, the other thing I want to say to you, this is a metaphor for shame, disgrace, and defeat. And that seems to fit right here. You might want to see Psalm 72, verse 9, Isaiah 49, 73, and Micah chapter 7, verse 17. Okay? Then it says that I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now, enmity is only used between persons. And it seems that the evil one uh, taking possession of this snake is not between the snake that we're talking about, a snake and a woman. And it was amazed me in some of the commentators. They thought this verse was nothing more than women don't like snakes. Uh, other commentators, especially the old classical reformers, thought this verse was, one of the, was called proto-evangelism, or one of the highest points of the early preaching of the gospel. Listen to what Luther said about verse 15. This text embraces and comprehends within itself everything noble and glorious that is to be found anywhere in the scripture. My goodness. Now friends, I think it's that proto-evangelism myself. So the enmity is between persons, not simply uh, women and snakes. And look at the next one. Between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Now, this seems to imply descendants. Well, does that mean this verse is simply saying there's going the as broods of vipers come along, the the children of men are going to be afraid of them? I think not. I think it's that illusion here of the children of Satan 
versus the children of God. John puts that so clearly several times. We see it first in Matthew 13, beginning verse 38, and then we see it very clearly again in John 8, 44. Uh, Hebrew has very few adjectives, so it often speaks of the sons of the devil and the sons of God, and that's what I think this verse is referring to. I think there's more here connected with the person of Christ, because you know the plurals up here of seed in the next part of verse 15 is changed to the singulars, he and you. Now, the you is singular and the he is singular. Now, there's been a lot of problem here because the Vulgate makes the he a she, and Roman Catholics have always asserted it refers to Mary and the virgin birth. Now, I do believe it does refer to the virgin birth, but I think it's more than that. I think it's not only the incarnation of Christ, but the life, the teaching, the sacrificial death, and the resurrection and ascension of Christ. All of that, I think, is caught up in the bruising of Christ's heel being the crucifixion and the crushing of the Satan's head being the defeat of the kingdom of the evil one. Now, there is no Greek manuscripts that back up the Vulgate. Jerome recognized there was a problem here but did not correct it when he made the, the translation. Now, so because of the play between singular and plural, I think it's the evil one and his, God and his, through the uh, intermediator uh, sacrificial atonement of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Now. When it says, you shall bruise him on the head, you might well see Romans 16.20. Now, the word bruise can be pound or crush or hit or strike. But because it's used in both of these uh, clauses here, a uh, bruise would be pretty good. Although we don't think of a certain bruising someone's heel. But if it's a poisonous serpent, you get bit on the heel, you still die. And so it's the ideal of death, I think, that's, that's caught up here. Now, people say, well, this is just later in the church thought of it being messianic. And it's true that... Um, I believe it's um, Ignatius is the first, or Irenaeus, one of those two, to mention this as being messianic in the Christian church. But friends, I want you to know the Targum, which is a Hebrew understanding and Aramaic, uh, thought this was messianic from the very beginning. And so it's not something that's a late development in the church. Now, uh, notice where it says, and to the woman he said. Now, the following in verse 16 is, is caused a lot of people problems, especially in our current cultural situation. We're in modern America. We are very big on the, on the equality of people. We have a lot of movements around uh, children's rights and women's rights and minority rights. And, and, and I understand that, and I'm happy for that, for I think that Christ has is certainly made all people um, the same before him. There are no barriers. And yet I think in the current climate of feminism, this verse is depreciated too much. For I think it does show the general characteristic of what's happened in history and still happens today in many ways. So let me look at it with you. And, and don't let your biases come in here immediately. Let me talk for a minute before you reject or uh, enthusiastically affirm what I say. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, New Testament confirmation of this truth seems to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 15, where Paul picks up on that, as he does very often, for the condition between men and women. There is an estrangement between men and women. There is an uncomfortable relationship sometime. This seems to imply that something of Eve being the mother of all the living is going to be affected in her fall. She is the one that fell first. Apparently, there's going to be great problems and pain in bringing forth children. And not only is there going to be pain in childbirth, but apparently she's going to have too many kids that she can handle. Now, this is related to God saying, be fruitful and multiply, which was God's will. And yet now it's going to be a problem. For she is going to, going to des want to desire uh, her husband, and yet there's going to be problems involved, not only in having children, but in the number of children and between her relationship to her husband. The dominance of the man here is direct consequence to Eve trying to be independent and wanting to be like God, apart from discussing it with her husband or even waiting till he was present. And so as uh, man, which uh, let his wife take control, is now put back in control. And because of the sinfulness of, of uh, man, this has been abused and, and, and terribly uh, overstated. God, uh, help us, we have abused every gift he's given us. And so that the marriage relationship has some tension. Now, I really think as a conservative Bible exegete, that we must balance our new understanding, our new conditioning in Christ with these Old Testament curses and patterns that were set for all humanity. Let me show you what I mean. 
we must take 1 Corinthians 11.11 11 and Galatians 3.28 seriously, which speaks of our new condition in Christ, our freedom in Christ, our uh, new standing in grace. And yet, even the New Testament recognized that this is still in place. You might want to see Ephesians 5.22, Colossians 3.18, 1 Peter 3.1. There still is an order in creation because of the fall between men and women in marriage. Now you may not like that. It may go against your cultural sensibilities, but be careful not to let your age interpret the Bible, but to allow the Bible to speak for itself. And I think it speaks clearly here that there is a tension in marriage, a problem in child rearing, going back to the original uh, parent sin. Now, Notice where it mentions here um, in verse 17. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree about which I command you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Now you see what really happened is Adam listened to Eve instead of God. Uh, that's why Eve's put in a subordinate place. Now, there have been some noble thoughts that I mentioned last week, particularly the rabbis and some of the early church fathers saying, Adam did this because he didn't want to lose Eve, and he did this to consolidate, consolidate their relationship. I don't really understand. It seems to me that Eve acted to Adam as the serpent did to her. Um, but we can't read too much in here. We get in real dangerous ground when we try to figure out the psychological motives of Bible characters. We just can't do it. It's impossible. All we have is the written text. We don't have inflection of language. We don't have the psychological insight of motives. That's why God, in the end, has to judge men. Now it says, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Now the word for ground is the word Adama, and the word for, of course, man is the word Adam. The only place it's a, a proper name is in these early chapters. It occurs several times through here, but most people translate it because it, it does not have the definite article, the man. Okay. Now, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Now this cursing of the ground, or cursing of, of material, uh, non, um, how should I put it, non-conscious uh, material creation, uh, is adequately discussed in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 and following, that everything fail, everything groans, everything is going to be redeemed. Jesus' death redeemed the creation as well as man. But there is a problem now. As women have problems connected with the thing that gives them joy, which is their motherhood and their family, men are going to have problems in the thing that brings them joy, which has always been their vocation, their work. Now, Adam was told to tend the garden before the fall, but now he's going to be forced to tend the earth for food. I think work brings great dignity to men and women in our culture, and that's good. But the problem is, but it also causes us terrible psychological and physical pain. Uh, there are many people who get caught, so caught up in work that their families are neglected, that their bodies are neglected. We get all kind of ulcers and high blood pressure from the push, push, push of corporate America. And even those who do physical labor, uh, sometimes we just wear our bodies out doing something to make a living. And in the end, it all seems to be so fruitless. There's nothing left. Now think about that. So notice it says here, both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. There's been a lot of discussion here about what this means, you shall eat the plants of the field. It's obvious that man who had the run of the garden as far as the fruits and the, uh, the uh, uh, grains, the cereals, uh, is now going to continue to eat those kinds of food, but there th there's going to be problems. Now, Rashi says this is where gnats and aphids and ants and mosquitoes and uh, all kind of bugs came from is this curse. And they begin to destroy uh, nature's crops. And man's going to have to deal with that along with the weeds and poisonous plants that came at this point. There's some truth there in that. I think those kind of things did come. Or at least they changed uh, what they f uh, fed on at that point. And so man is going to work hard and get little in return. But he's going to have to work because there's no other way to provide for him and his family. Verse 19, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the Adama, the ground, because from it you were taken. It goes back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where God made man out of the dust of the ground. Male and female made he them. 
And so the ideal is that man's biological thing is basically uh, biochemically the same as the chemicals or rocks or minerals of the earth. And when man dies, his body decomposes and he goes back to that farm. That's what he's talking about. So death, physical death, is going to result. Now back in chapter 2, verse 17, where it says, if you eat the tree, you'll die, it's obvious that was referring to spiritual death and his relationship with God. But physical death is also a punishment of sin. It's not a natural order of biological units. It is a, a judgment on man's sin. Genesis chapter 5 is a, an obvious fulfillment of, and he died, 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 and so will you and I, because we've sinned against God. Physical death is a judgment on sin. Now, notice where it says, from the dust. You might want to see Ecclesiastes 3.20 with the same ideas mentioned that we are from the dust. I like that thing. It says, God has a patience with us because he knows we are but dust. We are animated dust with the image of God. And if we know Jesus, we have the life of God. It will be a part of his family. But we're still creatures. Uh, and the temptation to be the creator is what caused the whole problem. It caused Satan to fall, Lucifer. It also will call us to fall. Now, notice, you, if you will, here in verse 20, And now man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of living. Now, the etymology of the word Eve and the etymology of living is not a scientific etymology, but a popular etymology based on sounds. Now, some have thought that when you go back to the Hebrew word, it's very close to the word for life, and maybe the, the Y and the W could be changed in them. Uh, but that's an assumption. I think this verse 20 is as significant as verse 15. I see in verse 15 the first real promise of grace to man that though there's going to be continual warfare between the children of men and the children of the evil one, that the, ultimately God's kids are going to prevail. I think Adam caught some of that in verse 20 where he named Eve again. He had already called her Isha, coming out of man, Ish, but he calls her another name here. It shows that he is master of his wife by, as he is the animals by naming her. But it also, I think, is a hope that she is going to bring life from her seed, uh, from her womb. I think it's an allusion back to verse 15. In some sense, this is Adam's repentance and faith, if you want to put those kind of terms on it. Others have said it's Adam's self-assertiveness that we'll make it our own way, thank you, God. But I think that's totally inappropriate. And reading much more of our biases from Milton's Paradise Lost in here uh, than it is from the text itself. So I think she's the mother of all living means she's going to be the mother of all humankind. It's ironical she's also the mother of death. But here she is the mother, Adam calls her the mother of living too. And the Lord God made garments. Notice the, the combined name, Yahweh Elohim, God in his cr creative powers and God in his mercy, made garments, skins for Adam and for his wife, and he clothed them. Now this apparently is the first time that animals died. We, I think it's a sign of God's gracious provision and care for man. Once he left the controlled climate of the garden, the harshness of the fallen world would be on him. I think this graciousness can be seen very clearly in the phrases that are used for Yahweh in Exodus 34, 6, and you might see that. Some have said it's possibly a sign that man could eat animals or use animals for sacrifices. Uh, in your outline, I have uh, compended for you uh, some of the theories connected with man killing the animals, and I want to show you these series of interpretations, which really I could do for any point in this first few chapters of Genesis, because they have been so many theories. People have looked, gone to other parts of the Scripture and related it back to Genesis. Now, I think that's appropriate in some ways to allow the Bible to interpret itself, but it's also inappropriate because we're reading too much of our personality, too much of our denomination, too much of our culture, too much of our experience back into a very limited scriptural witness. Uh, these early 1 through 11 sets the stage for the whole Bible, and yet it's so succinct, it's so brief, we can't read too much in it. We need to get the major pillars. It's as, as, it's as bad to add to the Bible as it is to take away from here are some of the examples of, in one point to show you how many interpretations there are. Uh, this was done so that provision for the hard life outside Edom could be accomplished. Number two, to cover their sense of shame and nakedness. As God was going to cover their nakedness, God's going to cover their sin later on is the implication. Number three, to show the lawfulness of using animals for man's needs the skins here, later the flesh for food, and, and the body for sacrifice. Um, 
to teach the concept of clothing. <laughs> that was far-fetched. Uh, next, to show the difference in man's provision, fig leaves, versus God's provision, leather. <laughs> Somebody's pretty wild, aren't they? Next one. To remind them of their own coming death, as the animals had to die to buy their needs. Um, and I, I don't know how God tanned that real quick. Maybe that skin on them and the death will remind Adam of his death. Uh, maybe so. Next, to foreshadow the clothing metaphor of Christ imputed righteousness given us as a new garment. And of course, this is reading in some uh, full-blown New Testament theology about that we have the imputed righteousness of Christ, like 2 Corinthians 5.21, in using the metaphor of clothing. And then lastly, to show God's continuing love and provision even though man was fallen. Now, there's an element of truth in all of those. Uh, what exactly it means, we can't be certain of that, and we can't use this uh, one text to back up all our theology about God or man or whatever. Now, notice it says here, um, then in verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Now here is one of those unusual plurals of Genesis. We saw it back in chapter 1, verse 26. We'll see it again in chapter 11, verse 7. Uh, many say it's a later grammatical form that we know from much later called the plural of majesty. Some say it simply is God and the angelic host. I think both those are based on preconceived notions. The Jews came up with the plural of majesties, and those who, um, who see the angelic council as active in creation or active in God's controlling the world see the other. Uh, I am a Trinitarian, not because I want to be, but because I think Scripture Revelation demands that. And therefore, I see here, a, as, as 315 is a proto-evangelism, I see this as proto-Trinitarian. Now, we know that God's a plurality. The word Elohim is plural. Uh, the plural use of us, man in our image, is plural. Uh, in the great uh, monotheistic prayer of Judaism, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, called the Shema, the form of the word one, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord, is a plural form of the word one. And we see that from Genesis 2, 24, where it says, A man shall leave father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one. Exact same form. I think it's also important that we see the manifestation of the angel of the Lord, example, the burning bush of Exodus 3, where it said the angel of the Lord... Uh, came in the bush, but God spoke out of the bush. There God and the angel are identified. And so there we have a plurality in God uh, very early. I think it comes into the idea that though we, would, that we only believe in one God, not three. But if Jesus is fully divine and the Holy Spirit is a person, we've got three uh, in one God. Now, I know it's hard. I hope you'll send for my tape on the Trinity. I've done extensive work on this in the New Testament. No, I'll be happy to make it available to you. The tree of life is mentioned here, back to Genesis 2, 9. Many of the early uh, Near Eastern accounts mention a tree of life. None of them mention a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, many of them have angelic beings guarding the tree of life. We're going to get to the cherubim in just a minute. There is some connection between the Bible's account of creation and fall and the other accounts like the Gilgamesh epic and Adapa and all of those. And I know that the later Persian Zoroastrian um, a creation account but there is great differences also. Now, notice where it says, Therefore the Lord God sent him from the garden. Now the word sin is a very strong uh, Hebrew term. It's the word used in Deuteronomy 21.14 for a man divorcing his wife and, and sending her away. It's also used in 1 Kings 9.7 for God uh, taking Israel uh, out of the land, sending her out of the land. So it's a strong term. Now, it mentions the cherubim and the flaming sword. Some see the cherubim holding the flaming sword. Some see them as two different entities guarding. It shows that Eden had boundaries and how long Eden remained and uh, man could see it or see the, the cherubim and the flame, we don't know. Whether it was taken away at the flood, that's some speculation. We just don't know. Now, the cherubim are an interesting uh, creature. I've done an extensive list on your uh, outline and I will talk about cherubims until we come to the end of our uh, allotted time together. It's one of several types of angelic beings. There seems to be a composite nature between the cherubim and the seraphim of Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, seraphim have set number of wings, but the cherubim 
uh, seem to move between those numbers. The etymology of cherubim, which is plural, and cherub, which is singular, is uncertain. Some say it comes from the Akkadian, meaning intercessor, which stands between God and man, bringing the prayers of man to God. Others say it comes very close to the Hebrew word chariot, and there's a possibility there. Others say it simply means bright or brilliant appearance, and that may be true, we just can't be sure. The form has been very difficult to ascertain because there are different uh, parts of the Bible that describe them differently. Some places say they have one face, some two, some four. Some say they have two wings, some four, some six. Uh, and so it's very hard to lock this down. In your notes, I've shown you all of this. Many have tried to go to the ancient Near East and find something connected with the other animal uh, uh, human farms with wings that we have found in archaeology to say this is what a cherub looks like. Some say the winged bulls of the fertile crescent empires of Assyria and Babylon are the background to the cherubim. Some say it's the winged lions have a head, I mean the head of an eagle, the wings of an eagle, but the body of a lion that we find in Egypt called the griffins. Others have said they're the winged creatures like we're on um, the king of Tyre's throne, Hiram's throne. That may be true. Uh, some say it's like the Sphinx of Egypt, similar to what we found in King Ahab, the king of Israel's ivory palace. That may be true. We're just not certain. Now, the, the biblical material, if I could quickly. First of all, they are the guardians of the tree of life, first time they appear, Genesis 3:24, And the allusion to that is found, uh, and by when I say allusion, you realize that in Ezekiel 28, it says that Satan was in the Garden of Eden and that he also was a covering cherub. That's Ezekiel 28, 14 and 16. Uh, they're, they're on the tabernacle. They're in the Temple of Solomon. They're in Ezekiel's temple. They're in uh, many other places in the Old Testament. The throne, they carry the throne of God. They're uh, in Herod's temple. By Josephus' time, it says we do not know what they look like and we're going to have to leave it with that. I've enjoyed being with you. I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week.